Chapter 341, Punishment and Resignation. Dumbledore, Umbridge began, her eyes slowly opening. Professor McGonagall, with a stern yet distressed expression, called for Dumbledore and proceeded to check on the students. Dumbledore entered the room with his usual calm demeanor and addressed Umbridge. Investigator Umbridge, may I inquire what my students have done to warrant such punishment? They violated the educational decree by assembling to create what they called Dumbledore's army, didn't they? Umbridge questioned, turning to a Slytherin student beside her. Had Pansy been present, she would have recognized her diligent boyfriend. That's utter nonsense, George protested vehemently. Fred joined in, exclaiming, We haven't done anything wrong. She's spouting lies. Is that so? Umbridge replied with a sinister smile. Turning to Dumbledore, she said, I have informed Minister Crouch about the situation. He is very interested in the matter of Dumbledore's army and is already on his way here. In that case, please allow us to relocate to a more suitable location to welcome Minister Crouch, Dumbledore suggested, his voice exuding centuries of wisdom. Umbridge's primary goal was to undermine Dumbledore. Everything else was secondary. Thus, she escorted Harry to Dumbledore's office. Harry attempted to speak to Dumbledore several times during their walk, but Dumbledore avoided eye contact. Upon their arrival, they were greeted by Barty Crouch Sr. and two Aurors, one of whom was Kingsley, whom Crouch seemed to trust implicitly. Dumbledore, Crouch greeted with a grimace. I've been informed by the investigator that you're attempting to form an army within the school. Crouch would typically allow Umbridge to manipulate situations to her advantage, but the accusation of Dumbledore organizing an army at Hogwarts was too serious for him to ignore. Upon entering the office, Crouch's demeanor was no less severe. Dumbledore, although you have resigned as the chief warlock of the Wizengamot, you are still bound by the law, he stated. What would the parents of these students think? Eager to prevent Dumbledore from outmaneuvering them with his eloquence, Umbridge stepped forward obsequiously. Minister Crouch, I have received a report and uncovered this behavior. Shall I bring in the witness? Umbridge seemed well prepared, leaving Crouch with little room to maneuver. She briefly exited and returned with a girl whose face was covered. Harry recognized her as Marietta, a friend of Cho Chang, whose face was marred by dense purple pustules spelling out informant. Harry recalled Hermione's clever modification to the original agreement. Umbridge recounted the process of whistleblowing, much to Harry's frustration. Enough, Crouch interrupted Umbridge, his gaze fixed on Marietta. Why isn't she speaking? I haven't found a cure for this condition yet, Umbridge admitted reluctantly, a hint of pride swelling in Harry at Hermione's spellcasting prowess. Sensing Crouch's growing displeasure, Umbridge quickly added, the Educational Decree No. 20 has been in effect for nearly six months, making any gatherings during this period illegal. Dumbledore, observing Umbridge with a polite yet keen interest, responded, If they did indeed continue to meet after the decree was enacted, they might be breaking the law. Just as Umbridge's smile began to form, Dumbledore shifted the conversation. But what evidence do you have to prove that such a gathering occurred afterward? As Dumbledore spoke, Harry noticed a rustle behind him and heard Kingsley mutter something under his breath. A brief moment of confusion crossed Marietta's eyes. Umbridge believed she had solid evidence. Although she couldn't make Marietta speak, she expected her to nod in affirmation. However, contrary to expectations, Marietta denied all allegations. Professor McGonagall was also present, participating in the questioning. It became apparent that Kingsley's muttering was likely a spell influencing Marietta to answer truthfully. In a moment, Tia Fury, Umbridge grabbed Marietta, spinning her around and shaking her with such force that for the first time, Dumbledore's expression turned into a scowl. Reacting to this, Umbridge released Marietta as if her hands were scorched, retreating hastily. I will not tolerate such rough treatment of my students, Dumbledore declared, his voice stern and unwavering. Barty Crouch Sr., observing the scene with a frown, watched as Umbridge hastily produced a list and handed it to him. Upon seeing the signature at the top, he inhaled sharply. Dumbledore, please tell me this is some kind of joke, he implored. Dumbledore, with a frankness that defied expectation, admitted, since it has come to light, I must acknowledge the existence of Dumbledore's army. What? 
Barty Sr. exclaimed, his tone grave. You realize the implications of this? Indeed, Dumbledore replied, cutting off Harry just as he was about to speak. But it is Dumbledore's army, not Potter's army. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Dumbledore announced, It seems I can no longer remain at the school. I will resign and accept full responsibility. Barty Sr., with a look of mixed emotions, responded after a dry cough, If you're willing to take the fall for your students, then I accept your resignation. The news of Dumbledore's resignation sent shockwaves through the school. Harry was particularly struck, feeling a deep sense of guilt for his role in the events that led to Dumbledore's departure. Meanwhile, the news was met with various reactions. John expressed surprise at the announcement, while Malfoy couldn't hide his glee, seeing it as a downfall for Potter and his group. John, however, noted that at least the situation was resolved peacefully, despite the unfortunate outcome. With Dumbledore's resignation, the position of headmaster was left vacant. Umbridge aspired to fill the role, but Barty Crouch Sr. saw through her ambitions, knowing her tenure would be short-lived. The logical choice for acting principal would have been Professor McGonagall, given her qualifications and status. However, her reluctance to take the position, combined with Barty Sr.'s relief, left the position temporarily unfilled. McGonagall's presence would have significantly hindered Umbridge's authority, especially given McGonagall's unwillingness to let injustices pass unchallenged. In a different turn of events, Daphne and a visibly upset Pansy approached John for a private conversation. They retreated to the Star Club to discuss a personal matter concerning Pansy's boyfriend, who had been revealed as one of Umbridge's lackeys. This betrayal was too much for Pansy, leading her to break up with him. John was initially puzzled by Pansy's distress, until Daphne explained she had used the howling curse, adding a layer of complexity to the situation. Pansy's discovery of her boyfriend's intentions to poison someone, evidenced by a vial of poison she found him with, raised serious concerns. After testing the poison on a mouse, which died instantly, the gravity of what her boyfriend was planning became clear, leaving them to ponder the potential target and the implications of his actions. Chapter 342 acting principal and candidates, who could possibly be the target of such a sinister plot within Slytherin. The question loomed large in the air. With Pansy's current status as the girlfriend of a minor character and the limited circle she could influence, the hero of Gryffindor was certainly out of the equation. So who in Slytherin was worth the effort of poisoning? Draco Malfoy. Setting aside the question of whether Malfoy was a worthy target, even with Lucius Malfoy's allegiance to Voldemort, it seemed unlikely. That left only one possible target, John Wick. The reason behind the certainty that Voldemort was behind this nefarious plan was simple. Only he would stoop to such despicable tactics. Poison, John mused with a light chuckle, turning to Pansy with a hint of approval. Pansy, you've outdone yourself this time. Pansy blushed, unaccustomed to praise, and stammered her thanks. John reassured her, leave this matter to me, we mustn't tip our hand too soon. Daphne nodded in agreement, while Pansy, tears drying on her cheeks, harbored a silent hope that John would finally lift the howling curse. After all, hadn't he accepted her feelings that night at Daphne's, albeit under the influence? Before she could voice her thoughts, Daphne swiftly covered her mouth, silencing her with a smile. Let's leave him to it, she said, dragging a protesting Pansy out of the room. Alone, John's gaze lingered on the departing figures. He toyed with a ring on his finger, murmuring, The stage is set, now we just need the actors. Raising his hands, a magnificent crown materialized, adorned with the sinister glow of the soul-eating curse. A small, unwilling snake emerged from the crown, bathed in a green light. In the wake of Dumbledore's forced departure, Umbridge wasted no time in asserting her control. She began by summoning members of Dumbledore's army for individual interrogations, armed with photographs provided by a clever student. Rumor had it, courtesy of Malfoy's gossip, that Umbridge had secured a bottle of Veritaserum from Snape, still intent on expelling Harry Potter. Zhang Muji, the renowned Chinese philosopher, once said, You point the gun at me, yet accuse me of bullying you, Malfoy remarked, puzzled by John's cryptic comment. It means that those who are righteous are often the ones condemned by the world, John explained, setting aside the newspaper. 
The headlines screamed of Dumbledore's confession to forming a secret army, leading to his resignation and disappearance. A sad end for the once great white demon king, John mused. Had he been less kind and more ruthless, perhaps his fate would have been different. But then, he wouldn't be Dumbledore. Umbridge's lack of foresight and understanding of Slytherin's true nature was her downfall. She underestimated the man who had defeated Grindelwald and was hailed as the greatest wizard of the century. This oversight marked her as expendable in the grand scheme of things. For John, however, this was an opportunity. Turning his attention to the future, John considered the candidates for the next headmaster. He dismissed Professor Sprout and Professor Flitwick, despite their respective merits, as neither suited the role during these tumultuous times. That left the snake and the lion. Choosing the snake, John pondered. Snape? A twinkle in his eye betrayed his intrigue. Snape's dual allegiances to Dumbledore and as a spy for Voldemort made him a complicated choice. Yet his position within Slytherin and his complex character could serve the school's needs in ways others could not. Excluding the headmaster, Professor McGonagall remained. He gently placed the snake down, yet refrained from releasing it. Not Snape, but there's still a Slytherin left. He watched as Basil swiftly returned, dropping a letter into John's hands. A smile tugged at the corner of his mouth as he quickly perused the letter. As expected, when faced with dilemmas, Slughorn, who values connections, steps forward to show concern. There was no one more fitting than Hass, him to be the last head of Slytherin. The letter, penned by Slughorn, voiced his worries about the current state of Hogwarts. Even Slughorn, who initially sought to avoid any interaction with John, felt compelled to reach out to him. John picked up a quill and began to craft a response. He highlighted that the Ministry of Magic was considering appointing an interim headmaster to oversee the school's affairs temporarily. Professor McGonagall was an excellent choice, but her reluctance to assume the headmaster role, due to the circumstances surrounding Dumbledore, was well known. John believed Slughorn would understand Professor McGonagall's stance. She had principles and would not accept the position unless it was absolutely certain Dumbledore could not return. However, Professor McGonagall was equally opposed to the idea of Umbridge serving as the acting headmaster. After sealing the letter, John handed it to Basil, who had just taken a brief rest. Before being summoned once more, Basil playfully tuzzled Malfoy's hair. To Slughorn, and try to bring back another letter if you can, John instructed, rewarding Basil with small dried fish. Malfoy, fixing his hair, eyed John suspiciously. John, where are you off to now? I need to speak with Professor McGonagall. John understood that a letter might not be enough to sway Slughorn, who still saw John merely as a student. However, if other professors also supported his return, the situation might change. Upon reaching Professor McGonagall's office, John knocked on the door. Professor McGonagall was taken aback to see him. John had never sought her out before. Professor McGonagall, there are some matters concerning the school that I believe we need to discuss, John said, his smile unwavering. I understand your reservations about certain individuals serving as acting headmaster, but the position needs to be filled. Professor McGonagall's expression darkened. You're suggesting I take on the role of acting headmaster, Mr. Wick? No, no, I'm aware of your concerns, John replied, his smile still in place. That's why I'd like to recommend someone else. Intrigued, Professor McGonagall invited him in. Do you recall Professor Slughorn? John began once inside. Slughorn? Professor McGonagall remembered him, of course, but was surprised that John, a student, would bring him up. After all, Slughorn had retired and Snape had succeeded him. John handed her Slughorn's letter. Professor Slughorn has expressed his concern about Hogwarts's current situation. I believe he would serve well as the acting headmaster. Upon reading the letter, a look of surprise crossed Professor McGonagall's face. Not only did John have a connection with Slughorn, but it appeared to be a deep one. Slughorn's sympathy for John was evident, and John's suggestion seemed like a viable solution. If she herself was not to serve as headmaster, then indeed, Slughorn was a suitable choice. After a moment of contemplation, Professor McGonagall asked, What do you need from me? I hope you can collaborate with the other heads of houses to write a joint letter, John suggested, his tone calm and persuasive. 
Even the Ministry of Magic cannot ignore the united stance of Hogwarts's four househeads. I understand, Professor McGonagall nodded, her curiosity piqued. But why do you care so much about this? John chuckled. I thought you might have heard about the incident with Umbridge. At first, Professor McGonagall was puzzled, but upon mentioning Umbridge, she understood. Umbridge had attempted to suppress John, who had responded by rallying the Slytherin students against her. This story had circulated for some time. John was not one to remain passive. I can't help but wonder, Professor McGonagall mused, what it would have been like if you were in Gryffindor. Mr. Wick, Professor McGonagall mused, her thoughts wandering to a question she couldn't shake off. She found herself contemplating a scenario where, should John ever find himself at odds with Professor Snape to the point of dismissal, she would make an unprecedented effort to have him transferred to Gryffindor. This wasn't due to the boy's talent, which was undeniable, but rather because she saw in John the very qualities that epitomized Gryffindor House. John responded with a respectful tone, Professor, I have given this matter considerable thought, and I believe I have found my answer. His confidence was palpable as he added, Yes, to be the king of Slytherin. Impressed by his determination and clarity, Professor McGonagall assured John that she would discuss his situation with the other heads of houses. As she watched him leave her office, she couldn't help but notice Draco Malfoy approaching John, falling into step beside him as naturally as if it had been preordained. It struck her then, watching them walk away, that John had an innate leadership quality about him, a magnetic pull that seemed to draw others to him effortlessly. He was, in every sense, a born leader, around whom others would gather, almost unconsciously drawn to his charisma and vision. Chapter 343, Longin and Snape's Memory John had a hunch about the destination of the Veritaserum bottle. Malfoy's interest in Harry's affairs was so meticulous that he was already aware of Umbridge's clandestine attempts to interrogate Harry by adding Veritaserum to his tea. Did you eavesdrop to find this out? John asked, his suspicion evident. Malfoy awkwardly averted his gaze, a clear admission of guilt. However, it seemed out of character for Snape to resort to using Veritaserum so recklessly at Umbridge's behest, especially when it involved torturing students. John's skepticism grew, particularly because Harry was the main target, raising doubts about the potion's authenticity. Suddenly, a frisbee engulfed in flames soared towards John. With a raised eyebrow, he effortlessly caught it, the flames failing to scorch his skin. Looking up, he noticed more flaming frisbees and fireworks darting through the corridor, accompanied by the unmistakable cheers of the Weasley twins. Their antics always managed to lift spirits at Hogwarts. Without hesitation, John released the fireworks, allowing them to scatter freely. Malfoy's jaw dropped in astonishment at the spectacle. Approaching the Weasley twins, who were concealed nearby, John asked with a grin, How many have you prepared? George shrugged. I'm not sure. We used everything we had. We initially planned to leave them for the students after graduation. Fred chimed in. Thanks to Silverhand's generous funding, we didn't have to hold back. The fireworks continued to illuminate the castle, creating a dazzling display that, despite its intensity, caused no harm to the portraits adorning the walls. Umbridge, in a state of panic, found herself without any support from the other professors. John caught sight of Professor Flitwick among the crowd, discreetly cheering on the chaos, clearly delighted by the turn of events. Umbridge was left to fend for herself, with even Filch setting aside his duties to enjoy the show, perched on a stool with Mrs. Norris in his lap, expertly naming each firework, a testament to his frequent dealings with the Weasley twins. The students erupted into laughter as one firework transformed Umbridge's hair into an afro. Pansy's boyfriend attempted to assist her, but was deliberately obstructed by the surrounding crowd. Umbridge spent the entire day in a futile attempt to manage the fireworks, with the professors conveniently turning a blind eye. By nightfall, she had barely made a dent in the cleanup. For the Weasley twins, the day brought more than just mischief. A letter from their angel investor, Silver Hand, announced an increase in investment due to their impressive inventions. George and Fred celebrated with a high five, followed by a jubilant tap dance in the lounge. The Gryffindor common room buzzed with excitement well into the night, until Professor McGonagall, 
her expression stern, ushered everyone to bed. Ron and Harry couldn't help but laugh, convinced they saw a hint of amusement on Professor McGonagall's face as she turned away. Harry, exhausted, yawned and headed to bed. Soon, his surroundings blurred, and darkness enveloped him. A light gradually emerged from the darkness, emanating from the wand in his hand. He found himself walking down a familiar corridor, the one leading to the Department of Mysteries. Despite his numerous visits, he had never opened the door. This time, however, the door swung open at his touch. He entered a circular room, which led to a rectangular chamber filled with the mechanical ticking of a clock, reminiscent of a second hand's relentless march. Undeterred, he continued forward until he reached a door at the room's end. Beyond it lay a dimly lit space, vast as a cathedral, with rows of dusty glass spheres on towering shelves. Harry's heart raced. He knew something of great importance to him was here. But then, a loud noise jolted him awake. The dark dormitory was alive with laughter. Seamus and the others were still discussing the day's fireworks, one of which had just exploded outside. Harry, his curiosity piqued, wanted to see more. Harry was overwhelmed, feeling as if the fireworks before him morphed into a massive serpent's head, engulfing him whole. Darkness enveloped everything around him, silencing the world. He attempted to call out to Ron, but found his voice trapped in his throat. Let me go! He wanted to scream as terror gripped him, feeling his limbs bound and his body adhered to a colossal stone, as if being torn apart. Tiny creatures seemed to crawl over his skin, sending shivers down his spine. Don't run away, Tom, a detached voice echoed through the darkness, chilling Harry to the bone. He frantically looked around, yet the pitch-black void offered no visuals. You should know that I possess the power to destroy you, the voice continued, unyielding. Amidst the darkness, a flame flickered to life, its golden hue so brilliant it seemed to make Harry's soul quiver in fear. No, it's impossible. How can this be? The screeching voice protested as Harry felt an unbearable burning sensation in his limbs. Straining his eyes, he saw the golden flame transform into a pair of eyes, exuding an indifferent and merciless judgment. Pain surged through Harry's scar, awakening him from the nightmare. It felt as though a fireball was lodged inside his head, threatening to burst. He buried his face in his pillow, struggling to calm the agony. When he finally lifted his head, the room was quiet, except for the distant sound of fireworks and the soft snoring of his friends, including a particularly tired Ron. Harry realized the importance of mastering a clumency, fearing the day his head might actually explode from such experiences. On Monday, Harry found himself distracted, especially during dinner. He noticed Cedric comforting Cho Chang at the Ravenclaw table, who was struggling with a friend's betrayal. Catching Malfoy's eye, Harry received a malicious grin in return. His stomach churned with unease, particularly at the thought of Snape, whom he hadn't seen in a while. Their last encounter involved Snape using his skills to shield his mind. Harry wondered if Snape harbored darker intentions. After dinner, Harry made his way to Snape's office, his steps heavy with dread. Upon entering, he was immediately reprimanded for his tardiness. Snape extracted some of Harry's thoughts with his wand, placing them into the pensive with meticulous care. After a cold exchange, they were interrupted by a knock on the door. Professor McGonagall sought Snape for a discussion, leading to the postponement of their lesson. Left alone, Harry's curiosity was piqued by the pensive, reminding him of his dream involving the Department of Mysteries. He wondered if Snape was hiding something crucial, perhaps related to the Department of Mysteries or someone named John. Despite his reservations, Harry's Gryffindor courage got the better of him. He approached the pensive and gently prodded the silvery substance with his wand. It swirled rapidly, transforming into what appeared to be a skylight through which Harry peered, driven by a mix of fear and determination to uncover the truth. He stepped into a room that bore a striking resemblance to an auditorium, much like the one he was familiar with. Overwhelmed by curiosity, he took a deep breath, feeling the chill of anticipation on his skin. With a sense of surrender to the unknown, he allowed himself to be enveloped by the cold darkness. After what felt like an eternity suspended in void, he finally landed with a soft thud on the floor of the auditorium. The atmosphere was eerily silent, the kind of silence that seemed to press against his ears. 
he slowly got to his feet, his eyes adjusting to the dim light that filtered through the high windows. The auditorium, once filled with the vibrant energy of students and professors, now lay deserted, as if it had been forgotten by time itself. He moved cautiously, his footsteps echoing in the vast space, creating a rhythm that seemed to breathe life into the stillness. The rows of empty seats stared back at him, witnesses to a bygone E, Ra. He could almost hear the faint echoes of laughter and spirited debates that once filled the air. As he ventured further, he noticed a podium at the front of the auditorium, bathed in a shaft of light that seemed to pierce the gloom. Drawn to it as if by an invisible force, he approached with a mixture of reverence and curiosity. The podium, crafted from ancient wood, bore the marks of countless years, each scratch and dent telling a story of knowledge shared and wisdom imparted. He reached out tentatively, his fingers brushing against the smooth surface, feeling the weight of history in his touch. It was in this moment, standing alone in the forgotten auditorium, that he felt a deep connection to the past, a sense of belonging to a legacy that transcended time. With a renewed sense of purpose, he turned to face the empty seats, imagining the faces of those who would one day fill this space again. The auditorium, once a relic of the past, now held the promise of future gatherings, of minds coming together in the pursuit of knowledge. And as he stepped back into the shadows, he knew that he was no longer just a visitor in this place. He was a part of its story, a link in the unbroken chain that connected the past to the future. Chapter 344, Image Collapse, An Angry Snape. Harry watched as the original four long tables of the Great Hall vanished, replaced by a hundred smaller ones. Sunlight streamed through the tall windows, illuminating the bowed heads of students engrossed in their exams. Among them, Harry spotted a younger Snape, unmistakable with his hooked nose, though his appearance was somewhat different from the man Harry knew. They were taking their OWL exams, and Snape, about 15 or 16 years old, was not much different in age from Harry himself at that moment. Professor Flitwick, looking notably younger, walked past a boy with shaggy black hair. Harry's heart skipped a beat as he recognized the boy. It was his father, James Potter, at 15. The resemblance between them was striking, the same thin face, mouth, and eyebrows. It was no wonder people often remarked on their similarity. Even their hair and hands were alike. Standing together, their height difference would be minimal. Harry also saw Sirius Black, his godfather, exuding a rebellious charm, even in his youth. Alongside them were Remus Lupin and Peter Pettigrew, completing the group that Harry knew as his father's closest friends. The scene shifted as Professor Flitwick attempted to collect the exam papers with magic, only to be overwhelmed and knocked down by the sheer number. Some students rushed to help him up, and the professor took the mishap in stride, not minding the laughter that followed. Following his father and his friends, Harry listened in on their conversation, amused by their banter. James's playful handling of a snitch, letting it fly a short distance before swiftly catching it, brought a smile to Harry's face. It was a trait he recognized in himself, though he never flaunted it as his father did. Under a beech tree, the group's dynamics unfolded further. Sirius expressed boredom, wishing for more excitement, while Lupin, ever the responsible one, suggested studying for transfiguration. Sirius's arrogant dismissal of the need to study contrasted sharply with the Sirius Harry knew, leaving him wide-eyed in surprise. James then directed Sirius's attention to Snape, who was gathering his exam papers. As Snape stepped into the open, James and Sirius confronted him, while Lupin and Pettigrew hung back, Lupin with a frown of disapproval. James's taunting greeting provoked Snape into drawing his wand, but James quickly disarmed him. Harry watched, stunned, as Sirius used a jinx to knock Snape down, turning the encounter into a humiliating spectacle. The mockery and laughter from other students that followed shattered Harry's image of his father. The cruel nickname they used for Snape and the taunts about his appearance were far from the noble image Harry had held. Snape's angry retort, filled with obscenities, left Harry conflicted. He wanted to believe Snape was just a nuisance but witnessing his father's and Sirius's bullying behavior made it difficult to reconcile with the respect and admiration he had for them. This moment of realization was a turning point for Harry, 
challenging his perceptions and forcing him to confront the complexities of his father's character. James cast a spell that left Snape's lips covered in bubbles, sending a chill through him. Let him go, a voice demanded. By the lake, a girl with dark red hair and strikingly green almond-shaped eyes approached, her expression one of anger. James's demeanor softened slightly. How are you, Evans? Just let him go, Lily Evans, Harry's mother, insisted, her distaste for James painfully evident to Harry. Why did he bother you? James asked, feigning contemplation over a significant matter. He shouldn't even exist if you catch my drift. Harry was disheartened to see his father behaving so cruelly, even thinking Malfoy seemed kinder in comparison. You think you're being funny? You're nothing but an arrogant, bullying jerk, Potter. Let him go. Lily's tone was icy. If you agree to hang out with me, I'll let him go, Evans, James proposed, his tone now mocking and flirtatio, s as if he were a spoiled brat trying to charm a decent girl. Just say you'll hang out with me, and I'll never bother the old snot again with my wand. In stark contrast, Snape struggled towards his wand, bubbles still foaming at the corner of his mouth. Lily made it clear she'd rather spend time with the giant squid than with James. At that moment, Snape managed to grab his wand and cast a spell at James. A flash of light later, James sported a bruise and blood trickled down his face. In retaliation, James cast a spell that left Snape suspended upside down in the air. Enough, enough, Harry muttered under his breath, his fists clenched as he heard the surrounding jeers. Lily pleaded with James to put Snape down, but Sirius's spell only added to Snape's humiliation. Harry was about to look away when suddenly a light caught his attention on the water. He saw a pair of vertical pupils surrounded by darkness before they vanished. It's him, it's him, Harry felt a chill. He was puzzled as to why this figure also appeared in Snape's memory. I don't need help from a filthy little mudblood like her. Snape's outburst led to a rift between him and Lily. Lily also rebuked James, which provoked him to further humiliate Snape. Before Harry could see more, he was abruptly pulled from the Penzive by Snape, who was visibly pale and agitated. Enjoying yourself? Snape's cold tone felt like a plunge into icy water. Are you pleased, Potter? Harry stammered a denial, trying to break free from Snape's intimidating presence. Your father was quite the character, wasn't he? Harry couldn't find the humor, feeling nauseated by the shaking. Don't tell anyone what you've seen. Snape's loss of composure was evident. Harry attempted to respond, but Snape cut him off. Get out! Get out! I never want to see you in this office again. In the Star Club, John held the crown, his complexion ghostly. Daphne's heart ached at the sight of him. John, what's happened to you? She asked, her voice trembling. John, struggling to stand, placed the diadem into another box. As the box snapped shut, he coughed up blood, alarming Daphne. John, I need to get help, she said, but he stopped her. Don't, just get the stars out he instructed calmly. Daphne hesitated but complied, opening the bottle for John. As he drank, he choked and coughed up more blood, terrifying Daphne. Live to death, John murmured, almost in a trance. After setting the bottle down, he stood, albeit unsteadily, and grasped Daphne's shoulders. Don't speak of this, Daphne, he implored, his grip firm. Tears filled Daphne's eyes as she looked at him. Are you going to die? she asked. John offered her a weak smile. I promise I won't die, he assured her, a statement that finally eased Daphne's worries. She promised to keep his secret. John, looking frail and ill, leaned in to whisper something in her ear, to which Daphne nodded, her tears held back. I'm sorry, but I can't provide the enhancements you're asking for without the original text or specific content to work on. Could you please provide the text or details from the novel that you'd like me to improve? Chapter 345 the Road to the Future, and the Silver Handbook. Despite Harry grappling with the shattering of his father figure, the Easter holiday was nearing its end. John had vanished, leaving even Malfoy, who had sought him out several times, unable to find him. Eventually, Malfoy too became engulfed in his studies, as the fifth and seventh years were swamped with preparations for the Owl and Newt exams, respectively. While the newt exam wasn't mandatory, the certification it provided was crucial for securing prestigious positions. Malfoy, seated in the library, observed the seventh years immersed in their studies, envisioning his own future post-exam. Will we still be studying like this in seventh grade? He pondered, 
a sense of dread about the future creeping in. Daphne, with a sharp retort, reminded him, you need to pass the owl exam with good grades to even consider the newt. Without achievement, you won't qualify to be in their shoes. Since when did you start sounding like Pansy? Malfoy quipped, half-jokingly questioning if Daphne and Pansy had swapped souls, given Daphne's newfound harshness. Unfazed, Malfoy dove into his studies, only to realize he had missed a lesson while he was preoccupied with his rivalry with Potter. Daphne, without looking up from her book, pointed out, You missed that lesson because you were too busy locking horns with Potter. Malfoy, determined to catch up, sought help from Cedric, only to be turned away as Cedric was busy tutoring Cho Chang. Left with no choice, Malfoy returned to Daphne and alongside Pansy, endured her biting remarks while studying through the holiday. As the Easter break concluded, the Slytherin common room was littered with pamphlets on various wizarding careers, and a notice about mandatory employment guidance interviews for fifth-year students was posted. Malfoy, eyeing a future in Quidditch, picked up a brochure about the sport. You're aiming to be a professional Quidditch player? John's voice caught Malfoy off guard. Turning around, Malfoy greeted John, who had finally re-emerged, looking healthier. Believe me, you wouldn't last a week in there, John joked, referring to Malfoy's earlier absence. If you give me a firebolt, I could manage for a week, Malfoy retorted, affirming his dream of becoming a professional Quidditch player. John then noticed Daphne holding an Auror promotional guide. Surprised, he asked, Are you planning to become an Auror? It's a field where you can truly make a difference, Daphne replied, her eyes betraying a hint of concern for John. Plus, the head of the Auror office could be directly promoted to director. You're really ambitious, Malfoy commented, impressed. Daphne, with a hint of pride, responded, The Greengrass family has always been ambitious. Turning the conversation to John, Daphne inquired about his future plans. John, with a smile, confidently stated, I plan to become a big shot. Like a director as Daphne wishes, Malfoy interjected. Perhaps even bigger, John replied, his ambition shining through, much to the admiration of Malfoy and Daphne. In Slytherin, Ambition was not uncommon, with many students already having clear career paths in mind, often influenced by their family backgrounds and the legacies of the sacred 28 pure-blood families. Whether inheriting family businesses or carving out their own paths, the future held endless possibilities. The Greengrass family, with their extensive connections to many officials within the Ministry of Magic, exemplifies the distinct advantage pure-blood families often have. Daphne Greengrass, being part of such a family, was privy to insider information, a privilege that Draco Malfoy also enjoyed. The Malfoy family's wealth and connections even made the idea of Draco pursuing a career as a professional golfer seem feasible, highlighting the vast difference in opportunities available to those with the right connections and financial resources. In contrast, the atmosphere in the Gryffindor common room was less ambitious. Ron Weasley, looking dejected, was examining a pamphlet from St. Mungo's Hospital, which outlined the stringent requirements for becoming a therapist. A newt score of at least E in potions, herbalism, transfiguration, charms, defense against the dark arts, he read aloud, feeling overwhelmed by the demands. That's a very responsible position, isn't it? Hermione commented nonchalantly, tossing him another booklet from Silver Cross Hospital, which seemed to have slightly less demanding requirements for similar positions. As they discussed the various career options, Harry Potter noticed a leaflet for Gringotts Spellbreakers, a position he thought Hermione might be interested in. However, she quickly dismissed the idea, expressing her disinterest in working with goblins or in a bank setting. The conversation shifted when Ron brought up Auror training, catching Harry's interest. However, their discussion was interrupted by Fred and George Weasley, who mentioned that Ginny had told them about Harry's desire to communicate with Sirius Black without risking interception by Dolores Umbridge, who was known for her invasive surveillance methods. Hermione, concerned about the risks of sending a letter or using the fireplace, which were both being monitored, was skeptical of finding a safe way to contact Sirius. However, the twins suggested using the Slytherin common room's fireplace, which Umbridge dared not monitor due to the influence of the pure-blood families. 
the twins playfully suggested that Hermione, with her impeccable reputation and the unlikely favor of the King of Slytherin, could be the one to gain access to the Slytherin common room for this purpose. Despite the potential risks and the knowledge that Sirius was not in good standing with some members of the Slytherin house, the plan was set into motion, showcasing the lengths to which Harry and his friends were willing to go to maintain their connections and protect their loved ones from the oppressive oversight of Umbridge. Hermione had an unexpected appointment arranged by the Weasley twins with John. What? When did this happen? Hermione exclaimed in shock. The twins exchanged mischievous glances. Fred, feigning a glance at his watch, suggested, If you run from here to the covered bridge, fifteen minutes should suffice. You're insane, Hermione yelled, bolting out of the room. Harry and Ron quickly followed suit. Behind them, the Weasley twins chuckled and exchanged a triumphant high five. Panting, the trio arrived at the covered bridge, only to find John approaching at a leisurely pace. Wait, Harry, let's stop, Ron urged, nearly causing Harry to stumble. Before Harry could inquire why, Ron, with a strained expression, whispered, I saw Malfoy. Peering over, they spotted Malfoy grimacing at a potions book in his hands. The trio knew too well that if Malfoy noticed them, trouble would surely follow. Hermione, however, briskly passed by Malfoy, who spared her only a brief glance before returning his attention to the book. Once they reached the covered bridge, Hermione took a moment to catch her breath. Observing her flustered state, John hesitated before asking, Is there something urgent you needed to discuss? After regaining her composure, Hermione couldn't shake off the thought of teaching the Weasley twins a lesson for their prank once she returned. Chapter 346 Career Guidance and the Slytherin Fireplace during this period, I had scarcely seen John. When we finally crossed paths again, Hermione greeted him with a warmth that was slightly tinged with embarrassment. Hello, John, she said, her cheeks flushed not from shyness but from the exertion of running. John, noticing her state, expressed his concern. Are you all right, Hermione? Do you need to take a moment to rest? No, uh, I mean thank you, but there's no need. Hermione stammered, internally cursing the twins for putting her in this awkward position. She found herself at a loss for words, unsure of how to broach the subject that had brought her to John in the first place. Sensing her hesitation, John offered, George mentioned you had something important to discuss with me. I'm here to help if I can. Hermione knew John was someone who would lend a hand without hesitation. Gathering her thoughts, she said, It's actually about Harry. He was hoping to use the fireplace in the Slytherin common room. Harry? John echoed, his curiosity piqued. Yes, he believes. Hermione trailed off, hoping to convey Harry's request without imposing. John, however, regretfully informed her, I'm afraid that won't be possible. There's an issue with the Slytherin fireplace. Hermione was taken aback. An issue? Yes, John explained. The fireplace has been tampered with. There's an additional monitoring device, very well hidden. I suspect it's the work of Pansy's boyfriend, who's been using it to communicate with the outside world. Given the circumstances, it wouldn't be wise to involve Harry. Disappointed but trusting John's judgment, Hermione shifted the conversation to a lighter topic. So, John, have you thought about what you'll do after Hogwarts? Career-wise, I mean. Leaning against the handrail of the gallery bridge with the wind caressing his face, John replied nonchalantly, And what about you? Have you made any decisions? I'm still considering my options, Hermione admitted, feeling more at ease in John's presence. I'm thinking about joining the Ministry of Magic. That could be a good path for you. Who knows, you might even become the Minister of Magic one day, John teased, a playful glint in his eyes. Hermione couldn't tell if he was jesting or not, but his words carried an encouraging weight. Never say never, Hermione Granger, John added, his gaze drifting towards the horizon. In that moment, with the wind tussling his black hair and revealing his contemplative expression, John seemed almost otherworldly. I should be going, he said, breaking the spell of the moment. I wish you the best of luck with your O-Double-Ls. Snapping back to reality, Hermione felt a surge of determination. I plan to outdo you this time, she declared. John laughed. I look forward to seeing that. Take care, Hermione. As he walked away, Hermione called out, John. We'll always be friends, right? 
John paused, turning slightly to show a smile. Probably, he said, leaving Hermione to ponder his ambiguous response. Later, when Draco Malfoy complained about the difficulty of their studies, John casually remarked, you might want to put in some effort unless you fancy extra lessons with Snape. Hearing that Harry had been receiving private tutoring from Snape due to poor potions grades, Draco grimaced. Fine, I'll try harder, but you'll have to help me with transfiguration. As they walked, John mused aloud, Draco, what would you do if I died? The question caught Draco off guard, his attempt at a carefree smile faltering as he struggled to respond. Kidding, aren't you? John was silent for a moment before he chuckled and replied, Of course. Did you really think I was going to die? Malfoy let out a sigh of relief, quickly catching up and complaining, Even if you don't want to help me with tutoring, you don't have to talk about dying, do you? If you don't put more effort into your transfiguration studies, I might indeed die of frustration, John retorted with ease. The conversation shifted away from the previous topic. John had been summoned for a discussion about career guidance. Upon entering Snape's office, he noticed that the Penzive had been moved. Sit down, Mr. Wick, Snape instructed, having just concluded a conversation with Goyle. From Snape's expression, John deduced that Goyle's career plans were less than stellar. Snape's attention seemed more focused upon seeing John. He adjusted his position for a better view. Wick, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on your future career so I can assist you in choosing which subjects to pursue in your sixth and seventh years, Snape said, his voice carrying its usual drawl. He eyed John intently. Unlike Mr. Goyle, I believe you have more intellect than a hairy troll, Snape remarked, attempting humor that fell flat. Snape continued to scrutinize John, urging him, Go on, Wick. I might be looking for something different, John said with a shrug. A specific role in a specific place isn't what I'm after. So, Snape pressed, his tone sharp, what do you aim to achieve on your own? Let's delve deeper, Wick. Snape uncrossed his legs, interlaced his fingers on the desk, and leaned forward. What do you aspire to be, Wick? This doesn't feel like career guidance, John observed lightly, meeting Snape's probing gaze. Which answer are you fishing for, Professor? The office fell into a tense silence, the air charged with the silent standoff between them. John broke the silence with a short, quick laugh, shaking his head in amusement at Snape. What's so amusing, Wick? Snape asked, his frown deepening. John's gaze drifted upwards to the ceiling, bathed in light, and he smiled. I just remembered my dream. Dream. To be the next. Dumbledore, John said, his smile ambiguous, as if mocking both himself and Snape. Unfortunately, that dream didn't last very long. He shifted his gaze back to Snape's astonished face and chuckled. Now, I don't aspire to be anyone else. John Wick is simply John Wick. I won't be the next Albus Dumbledore, nor the next Tom Riddle. He leaned back in his chair, relaxed, and asked, Professor, does this answer satisfy you? After a moment of silence, Snape replied in a non-committal tone, Wick, you may leave now. As John stood and walked to the door, he paused but didn't turn back. What do you live for in this life, Professor? Without waiting for an answer, he shrugged and exited. Stepping into the corridor, John's body shook, and he leaned against the wall, his forehead covered in sweat, his face pale. He took a deep breath to steady himself, then took out a silver bottle and sipped the medicine inside. His complexion gradually improved. It really took a toll, he muttered, his expression turning cold as he pocketed the exquisite silver bottle and made his way to the auditorium, regaining his composure. Upon arriving, he accidentally bumped into someone. Looking down, he saw it was Pansy's ex-boyfriend, a third-year Slytherin, who was nervously picking up John's fallen silver bottle. Sorry, I didn't mean to, the boy stammered, handing the bottle back to John. It's none of your concern, John replied coldly. You should focus on how to ingratiate yourself with those above you. Perhaps your methods of charming young ladies could prove useful. Pansy's ex-boyfriend's expression soured. After John walked past, a hint of hostility flickered in his eyes. As he entered the auditorium, he was greeted by the sound of commotion in the foyer. Dolores Umbridge's shrill, triumphant voice cut through the air. Well, do you think it was amusing to turn the school into a swamp? Hidden behind the distraction provided by Umbridge's fireplace, the Weasley twins had orchestrated chaos in the foyer, drawing an audience of students who had witnessed their deed. 
It was clear the twins had meticulously planned this act of rebellion. Surrounded and seemingly cornered, they faced Umbridge with defiant ease. It was amusing, yes, Fred stated boldly, meeting Umbridge's gaze without a hint of fear. Very well, Umbra, Idge sneered, her grin widening. You two will soon learn the consequences of misbehaving in my school. Her school? It appeared she was under the impression that the Ministry of Magic would grant her ownership of Hogwarts. You know what? Fred interjected, a spark of mischief in his eyes as he turned to George. I don't think we're cut out for full-time education any longer. Fred, I share the sentiment, George replied, his grin mirroring his brother's fearless demeanor. Fred nodded. We ought to apply our talents in the real world, don't you think? Absolutely, George agreed passionately. Before Umbridge could retort, the twins summoned their broomsticks with a well-practiced oxio charm. The brooms, chained together, landed smoothly in their hands. Mounting them, Fred declared, this is the last you'll see of us. Don't bother keeping in touch, George added, as both twins shared one last iconic smile with the gathered students. With that, they ascended, their laughter resonating through the hall like the calls of mischievous magpies. The twins' flair for the dramatic was unmatched. If anyone's interested in purchasing a portable swamp like the one upstairs, Fred called out, soaring higher. Head over to 93 Diagon Alley, Weasley's Wizard Wheezes. George chimed in, completing the advertisement. Stop them, Umbridge shrieked in vain. Pevs, do us a favor and teach her a lesson, Fred yelled back. The crowd erupted in cheers as Peeves, the poltergeist, materialized from the ceiling. With a flourish, he tipped his hat in salute to the departing trickster kings of Hogwarts. As the twins flew off, their laughter a final gift to Hogwarts, the crowd's cheers swelled into a thunderous ovation. John, watching from the sidelines, couldn't help but smile at the swamp below. He whispered to himself, There's so much untapped potential here. I'll have Tang Mi invest more in these brilliant minds. In that moment, he was convinced that what the wizarding world needed most were eccentric spirits like the Weasley twins, true embodiments of Gryffindor courage and inventiveness. Chapter 347, Hagrid's Secret and Grop. As exam week loomed, Hogwarts buzzed with activity. The library was often packed, with students claiming seats for hours on end. The Weasley twins, before their dramatic departure, left behind a legacy that celebrated the human desire for freedom. Their ability to resist and remain unbound was admired by many. Shortly after their exit, Weasley's Wizard Wheezes opened its doors. After a year of preparation, the shop quickly became a hit, proving to be the most profitable venture for the silver-handed angel investment, as reported by Tang Mi. John wasn't surprised by its success, though he wondered how furious Umbridge would be. With exams less than a month away, the Quidditch match between Slytherin and Hufflepuff was scheduled for Saturday. Malfoy approached John, requesting to borrow the firebolt for Cedric, aiming to challenge the student council president who had previously dominated him. Cedric, accepting the challenge, was determined not to lose. Hufflepuff has you, and Slytherin has us, Malfoy declared with arrogance. Cedric, still harboring resentment towards Malfoy for a past incident, was eager to prove him wrong. The competition was intense, with both friends committing various fouls on the field. Even the usually fair play Cedric resorted to foul tactics against Malfoy. The firebolt's speed was too much for Cedric, leading to a fall that likely resulted in a fractured arm. Malfoy, with a graceful glide, stopped in front of Cedric, taunting him with the golden snitch in hand. Slytherin's victory by 40 points was attributed to their cunning strategy, leaving little hope for Gryffindor in the upcoming matches. As the last weekend of May arrived, Gryffindor faced Ravenclaw. Malfoy's sneering prediction about Ron's performance was met with indifference by John, who declined an invitation to watch the match, opting instead to visit the Forbidden Forest. There, amidst the distant cheers of the Quidditch match, John encountered a Thestral, which affectionately rubbed its head against his palm. Surrounded by Thestrals, John was soon approached by Weiwei, a beautiful unicorn, who expressed concern for his well-being. Sensing his melancholy, Weiwei offered to lead John to Hagrid's secret. Deep within the Forbidden Forest, where the undergrowth was thick and the light dimmed to dusk, Weiwei navigated with ease. Unicorns, known for their speed and ability to evade hunters, 
moved swiftly through the forest. John followed Weiwei, curious about what Hagrid had hidden in the depths of the forest. After walking for a while and catching their breath, Weiwei looked around anxiously. John leaned against a tree to rest and asked, Weiwei, how much farther do we have to go? There's still a ways to go, John. You're too weak right now, Weiwei replied, her eyes brimming with tears. My father knows a way to help you. Clark can't help me, John said gently, stroking Weiwei's head. But thank you for caring. Once they had rested, they continued on their way, navigating through the underbrush. John used the Shattering Curse to clear a path through the thorny bushes. Eventually, they reached their destination. Weiwei approached cautiously and warned, That thing is dangerous. In front of them lay a huge black figure. I should hope so, John said, looking at the creature with a mix of resignation and concern. Weiwei added angrily, He almost pulled my tail off. Hagrid still hasn't learned. John mused, observing the creature. He had thought Hagrid's penchant for stealing fire dragons was the limit, but it seemed he also had a fondness for raising giants. Though this giant appeared smaller than others, it was still a formidable creature. Hagrid probably thinks he's harmless and cute, John muttered to himself. The giant, a sleeping behemoth, resembled a mound of earth more than a living being. It's a bit on the small side, John observed noting that the giant was no more than 16 feet tall. Compared to John's dragon form, the giant would seem insignificant. He not iced that the giant was bound with thick ropes, likely Hagrid's attempt to restrain it. It seems Hagrid has taken some precautions, John remarked as he approached the giant. Wei Wei, spinning around nervously, asked, What are you going to do, John? John drew his wand, his expression stern. This creature is not to be trusted. Are you going to kill him? Weiwei asked, visibly frightened. John paused, then turned to her with a helpless look. I'm not a monster, Weiwei. Oh, okay. Weiwei said, lowering her head, realizing she might have overthought the situation. As they moved to stand in front of the creature, John understood why Hagrid often showed up to class with bruises. Although he didn't know this giant's name, John felt there might be room for negotiation. Just then, they overheard a conversation from behind the giant. If I go, I must tell someone because I need your help, and Ron's too, if he's willing, Hagrid's voice carried over. Of course, we'll help you. What do you need us to do? Harry's voice responded. Hermione, sounding terrified, added, Hagrid, you said none of them wanted to come. Realizing the giant was the cause of Hagrid's injuries and not just a mound of dirt, Hermione understood the danger. Hagrid defended the giant. He doesn't realize his own strength. He's much calmer now not as prone to fighting. Hermione, upset, countered, if he didn't want to come, why force him? Wouldn't he be better off with his own kind? They all bully him because he's so small, Hagrid explained. Too young? Hermione questioned. And you want us, including John, to look after him? Hagrid, tears in his eyes, confessed. He's my brother, my half-brother. After my mother left my father, she was with another giant, and then Glop was born. Why haven't you told John? Harry asked, puzzled. Because John would frighten him, Hagrid replied, a statement that only added to their confusion. I'm curious too, Hagrid, a new voice interjected, causing Hagrid to nearly jump out of his skin. Chapter 348, The Horseman and the Sense of Oppression. Hagrid, who had been teaching Harry and Hermione how to care for Grop, suddenly froze, his face contorting into an awkward smile. John, John, he called out nervously. John emerged from the shadows, his expression unreadable. He prodded the slumbering giant with his wand and asked, Is this the creature you've been hiding? John, you'll wake him with that, Harry and Hermione exclaimed in unison, their voices tinged with fear. Hermione even screamed, Get out of there quickly! John raised an eyebrow, let out a sigh and asked, Hagrid, do you really think I'm that frightening? No, it's not that, John, Hagrid stammered, fumbling with his beard in an attempt to explain. It's more of a feeling, you know? His words were clumsy, struggling to convey his thoughts clearly. John looked at him blankly. So this giant is the one causing you trouble every day? Hagrid, tugging at his moleskin coat guiltily, clarified, This is my brother, Grop. It's not exactly trouble, he just can't control his strength. He was still trying to convince John of Grop's harmlessness when Grop stirred awake. Grop's face was large and intimidating, resembling a roughly hewn stone. 
His nose was short and misshapen, his mouth crooked, and his teeth jagged, resembling half-sized bricks. Upon waking, Grop's gaze immediately fixed on the beautiful unicorn, Wei Wei, who let out a soft cry and trotted out of Grop's reach. Only then did Hagrid notice Wei Wei's presence. As Grop reached out to catch Wei Wei, the rope binding him held him back. He turned his head in frustration and tugged at the rope. Hagrid quickly tried to calm him. Grop, be quiet. Don't touch that unicorn. But Grop, like a defiant child, ignored Hagrid's pleas and pulled at the rope with all his might. I say, Grop, stop that, Hagrid yelled, trying to distract him. Look here, I've brought someone to meet you. Hey, you big oaf, look here. Hagrid attempted to intervene, but Hermione pleaded. Hagrid, don't, Grop growled, ignoring them completely. John felt a headache coming on, as if he were standing beside a massive bear. Sensing another presence, Grop dropped the rope and reached for John with his enormous hands. John, Hermione screamed in terror. John, reaching his limit, turned sharply, his eyes narrowing as he growled, Cease your actions, unless you wish to lose your hand. A draconic aura of intimidation emanated from him, causing Grop to roar and stagger backward in fear. To Grop, the man before him had transformed into a colossal dragon capable of devouring him whole, and he screamed in terror. Cowering in fear, Grop appeared pitifully vulnerable. John, you frightened him, Hagrid remarked with a hesitant expression, but at least he's calmed down now. John glanced at Hagrid and approached Grop cautiously. With each step John took, Grop retreated, his fear palpable. Even Hermione, previously terrified, now saw Grop in a sympathetic light. Harry felt a strange reversal of roles, as if John were the true giant and Grop the unfortunate victim. Cornered and unable to flee, Grop crouched down, his cries becoming indistinct. Hag, Harry inquired, puzzled. Harger? Hagrid, concerned, explained. He's trying to say my name. He can't pronounce complex sounds. He rushed to Grop's side, comforting him. Grop, I'm here. Don't be afraid. This is your friend, too. You can call him. John. Aware of John's gaze, Hagrid rubbed his hands together sheepishly, admitting, it's difficult for him to pronounce your name. Seeing Grop still frightened, John extended his hand, sending a wave of calming mental energy towards him. Gradually, Grop's fear subsided, and Hagrid, eyes shining with gratitude, said, Perhaps I should have introduced you to him sooner, John. Who knew you considered me a threat, John retorted with a sneer. Hagrid looked both embarrassed and guilty. Harry and Hermione, observing from a distance, now felt emboldened to approach. With John there, Grop's emid less menacing, and the atmosphere lightened, marking the beginning of an unusual friendship. Hagrid, beaming with joy, suggested to Hermione, Could you let him call you Hermie? Your name seems a bit difficult for him. Hermione, still slightly apprehensive, replied, Anything is fine. Harry, on the other hand, was more adventurous. He approached the giant named Grop, finding him less intimidating than the dragon from the Triwizard Tournament. This is John, Hermie, and Harry. They'll be your friends from now on. Grop, Hagrid introduced, his voice filled with a mix of happiness and regret. He wished he had brought John sooner, thinking it might have made Grop more cooperative. Grop attempted to repeat the names, a hint of apprehension in his voice. Hagrid clapped his hands in delight, though it was unclear if Grop's reaction was out of fear. The first name Grop remembered was John's. A unicorn, glowing with a soft light, approached them. Unicorns, Hermione whispered in awe. This is Vivi, John introduced. Vivi bowed her head to Hermione, gently touching her forehead with her horn as a greeting. Hermione felt a peculiar sensation at the contact. Harry thought Vivi looked familiar, reminiscent of the unicorn he had encountered in his first year. It's time to head back, Hagrid announced, his mood a mix of elation and melancholy. He looked to John for confirmation, who nodded and thanked Vivi for her help. Vivi then gracefully walked back into the forest. As they made their way back, Hermione voiced her concern about Grop being discovered in the Forbidden Forest. John casually suggested they could claim Grop wandered in on his own, given the forest's vastness and the variety of creatures already residing there. Harry found this explanation enlightening, having not considered such a simple solution. Suddenly, Hagrid halted, alerted by the sound of horseshoes. He prepared an arrow on his bow as Harry and Hermione readied their wands, a deep voice announced their unwelcome presence in the forest. A centaur, illuminated by a soft green light, 
approached them, followed by several others. Hagrid greeted the centaur, Marjorie, cautiously. Bane, another centaur, angrily reminded Marjorie of their agreement regarding Hagrid's presence in the forest. Hagrid, irritated, questioned if he was the person they were referring to, recalling a past incident where he had intervened to prevent violence. Marjorie attempted to explain their laws and differences, but was interrupted by John, who stepped forward, challenging the centaur's stance with a calm yet authoritative tone. Even Bane, known for his temper, seemed fearful in John's presence. As tensions rose, Hermione expressed her concern, but John confidently dismissed the centaur's threats, implying they were seeking a confrontation he was more than willing to provide. His pupils narrowed beneath half-lidded eyes, and an overwhelming aura of menace enveloped the centaur. Let's see if I can eliminate you all, he uttered, each word dripping with a chilling resolve. As the final syllable echoed in the air, John lifted his wand with a swift, deliberate motion. A burst of white light surged from its tip, striking Bane with the force of a lightning bolt, ensnaring him in its luminescent grasp. Simultaneously, the other centaurs loosed their arrows, each one aimed with deadly precision at John. However, as the arrows sliced through the air towards their target, an invisible barrier intercepted them mid-flight. The projectiles halted, as if colliding with an impenetrable wall, before harmlessly dropping to the ground. The scene unfolded with a tense, electric energy, as the confrontation between John and the centaurs escalated. Each move was calculated, each counterattack executed with precision, highlighting the deadly dance between magical beings, where the balance of power could shift in an instant. Chapter 349, The Gold Cup and Crown John waved his hand lightly, and the arrow shattered, reversing its course. He dragged Bane away with a forceful pull, sending the centaur tumbling like pins struck by a bowling ball, their screams echoing through the air. With another sharp tug, Bane was dragged to John's feet. John looked down at him with a cold gaze. Weakness is not a sin in the struggle for survival, but arrogance certainly is. Do not dare to challenge a dragon with your fragile existence, John admonished, flicking Bane away with a mere flick of his wrist. He then sheathed his wand, his expression indifferent. The onlookers were stunned into silence. The centaurs, who had seemed invincible moments ago, were now unable to rise, crushed under John's imposing presence. Margaret, spared from the attack, could only watch in horror as John effortlessly subdued the centaurs. Lifting his gaze to Margaret, John offered a light chuckle. You possess more wisdom than your companions. Return to the centaurs of the Forbidden Forest and relay what you have witnessed here, he instructed. Margaret, drenched in a cold sweat, felt as though he had seen a black dragon laying waste to everything in its path. Life seemed so fragile before such might. He nodded, struggling to find his voice, and John lifted the oppressive aura. As John walked past, the centaurs recoiled in fear, too terrified to even move. Approaching Bane, who had sustained the most injuries, John's gaze was cold and detached, as if looking upon an inanimate object. Bane, understanding his place, slowly lowered his head in submission. Should Hogwarts students come to harm in the Forbidden Forest, I will hold the centaurs accountable without exception. Your intelligence should inform you that I am fully capable of making good on that threat, John warned, his sharp teeth bared in a menacing smile as he helped Bane to his feet, much like a dragon might toy with a lamb. The centaurs, now on their feet, remained silent as John turned away, his parting words hanging in the air. Come on, I'd wager this year's Quidditch Cup still belongs to Slytherin. Hagrid, who had been prepared for a centaur attack, lowered his crossbow, his body numb with shock. Harry, observing John's departure, couldn't shake the feeling that Firenze had been right. John was a person to be wary of. Upon hearing the mention of Slytherin winning the Quidditch Cup, Harry couldn't help but retort, then I'll bet on Gryffindor. John's non-committal chuckle left Harry doubting his own conviction. After exiting the Forbidden Forest, Hagrid felt a weight lifted from his shoulders, his spirits buoyed by the resolution of a troubling matter. Meanwhile, the Quidditch match was drawing to a close. Harry and Hermione headed off to catch the end of the Quidditch game, while John returned to the Slytherin common room. There, he encountered Pansy's ex-boyfriend, lounging with a book, seemingly indifferent to the Quidditch fervor. 
It's rare to find someone uninterested in Quidditch, John remarked, settling onto the sofa and taking a sip from the cup Daphne had given him for Christmas. Pansy's ex-boyfriend merely smiled behind his book, unbothered by the commotion outside. Soon, Malfoy burst into the room, his platinum hair gleaming, followed by Goyle and Crab, who were proudly displaying the silver trophy. The room erupted in cheers, with Montague particularly overwhelmed with relief and joy at maintaining Slytherin's winning streak. Malfoy, ever the showman, boasted loudly about their victory, recounting how Gryffindor had managed a thrilling win against Ravenclaw. The Weasley siblings had performed spectacularly, with Ron showcasing remarkable skill as keeper and Ginny securing the win by capturing the golden snitch right from under Cho Chang's nose. We were only twenty points shy of defeat, Daphne remarked, relieved that the game had ended in their favor. Malfoy, coughing awkwardly, admitted that his antics in a previous match against Cedric had nearly cost them dearly. Despite the Wea, Slay's explosive performance, Slytherin's dominance in Quidditch remained unshaken, their victory margin securing them the Quidditch Cup once again. As Montague watched Ginny Weasley's pursuit of the snitch, he couldn't help but admire her determination, a reminder of the fierce competition and spirit that defined the Quidditch season. Pansy Parkinson complained, he almost used a jinx with his wand. If he had been overtaken, he would have definitely gone mad. It's a good thing now, isn't it? We've maintained the record for the longest winning streak at Hogwarts, Draco Malfoy muttered under his breath. John glanced at Malfoy, sensing that if they had lost, Montague would have been the first to confront Malfoy about it. Despite Gryffindor's frustration with the point difference, Ron Weasley's exceptional performance had Angelina Johnson admitting she hadn't made a mistake in her choice. The celebration ended as the last Quidditch match of the season concluded, and the festive atmosphere that had enveloped the students quietly dissipated. The remainder of the term was dedicated to the library and the impending exam week. John seemed to be the only person at Hogwarts who didn't spend his time buried in books. At Silverhand Manor, Tang Mi looked at his boss and ventured a question. My lord, when I was your age, I never dreamed of skipping school every day. John glanced at Tang Mi, a hint of amusement in his eyes. You know what I'm going to say, right? Well, if my name had been Johnny Yincho back then, I probably wouldn't have wanted to attend school for even a day, Tang Mi admitted with a hint of melancholy. As a loyal subordinate, Tang Mi knew better than to apply common sense to his boss's actions. With less than two weeks before the exams, the other students at Hogwarts wished for extra brains and consumed pepper-up potion as if it were water. Meanwhile, John not only skipped classes, but also left school entirely to visit Silverhand Manor. Even Tang Mi couldn't help but worry about his boss's academic standing, though it soon became clear that his concerns were unfounded. John entered the secret room hidden behind the manor's garden. The Hufflepuff cup was securely encased under a transparent glass cover, surrounded by a container holding hundreds of souls. Release the souls, John commanded, his wand twirling as he drew the souls out like threads from a cocoon. In the unbreakable room, the Dementors appeared as if petrified by sickness. There are quite a few more, John observed, noting that the balance of power between Dementors and the Soul Eater curse remained in his favor as long as the Dementors lived. Turning his attention to the Hufflepuff cup, John mused, Gryffindor's sword is sharper, Ravenclaw's diadem is wiser, but what of you, Hufflepuff's cup? He reached out to touch the cup, and upon contact, a powerful surge of magical energy was released. John's eyes sparkled with anticipation as he was enveloped by the magic. The silver ring on his right hand glowed, and the magic crystal within it created a magnetic field. Thousands of black threads penetrated the golden cup, eliciting a shrill cry that seemed to pierce the soul. John held his breath as the black threads enveloped the cup. You should relinquish this object, John whispered. The cup screamed in defiance. No, it's impossible. How could you? With a flick of his wand, John brought forth the Dementor's soul. The black threads, intertwined with silver fragments of soul, transformed into razor-sharp scalpels, slicing into the golden cup. The fragment of Voldemort's soul within the cup resisted fiercely, but even the Dark Lord's aggression was no match for John's determination. 
Taking a deep breath, John's focus intensified. Return of the soul, he intoned, his voice carrying strange ancient syllables that resonated deep within the soul. Atop the golden cup, a small green snake transformed into a handsome young man, who was immediately ensnared by the black threads. The silver scalpels cut into his body, which was fused with them. H, the golden cup. You, the soul, cannot compete with me, John declared, his wand igniting the soul. The silver soul transformed into a golden flame, engulfing the golden cup. His eyes, now with vertical pupils, pierced through the essence of the golden cup as more and more souls were ignited. The screams emanating from the golden cup diminished progressively until, with a decisive tug, John extracted it completely. The small green snake, now a mere wisp of a spirit, attempted to flee. John, with a swift motion of his wand, transformed the soul into a thread of silk, binding it securely. As the cries of defiance and despair faded, the soul fragment was pulled into an obscure void. Having completed this task, John felt his strength wane once more. He collapsed, his complexion paling rapidly as a fleeting shadow of darkness flickered beneath his skin. The room fell silent, the only sound being John's labored breathing. He lay there, gathering his strength, the weight of his actions pressing down on him. The golden cup, now devoid of its malevolent inhabitant, seemed less ominous, yet its presence was a stark reminder of the dark path John had tread. With great effort, John pushed himself to his feet, steadying himself against the nearest wall. His gaze lingered on the cup, a mix of triumph and sorrow in his eyes. He had succeeded in extracting the soul fragment, yet the toll it took on him was evident. The black flash under his skin was a grim indicator of the dark magic he had wielded, a reminder of the fine line he walked between light and darkness. Determined to not let his actions be in vain, John began the process of healing, both physically and spiritually. He knew that the road ahead would be fraught with challenges, but the resolve in his heart was unwavering. He would face whatever came his way, armed with the knowledge that the light within him could overcome the shadows. As he made his way out of the room, the golden cup in hand, John couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. The battle against the dark forces was far from over, and he knew that he would need to be stronger, wiser, and more vigilant than ever before. But for now, he had won a significant victory, and that gave him hope. Hope that in the end, light would prevail over darkness. Chapter 350 Between Horcruxes and Strangeness In the past, Malfoy Manor in Wiltshire was a sight to behold, with white peacocks strolling majestically across its grounds. The interior was equally impressive, boasting luxurious furniture, marble fireplaces, and gilded mirrors that reflected the opulence of its inhabitants. The living room, adorned with purple wallpaper, exuded a sense of grandeur and wealth. However, that sense of nobility had been replaced by an unmistakable gloom. A persistent fog had enveloped Malfoy Manor, refusing to lift all year, casting a shadow over the once vibrant estate. The manor had become a haven for some of the most malevolent individuals known to the wizarding world. Lucius Malfoy sat cautiously on the right side of the long table, his posture rigid with tension. Beside him, Lippy, known by the alias Drogon, felt fortunate to have secured a seat among the gathering. The Death Eaters, having escaped from Azkaban, had returned to their master, but their reunion was marred by the oppressive atmosphere created by Voldemort's foul mood. It was clear to all present that the Dark Lord was teetering on the edge of a dangerous precipice, and no one wished to be the target of his wrath. Even the most loyal followers, like Bieber, dared not meet Voldemort's gaze, their heads bowed in submission. Who can tell me? Voldemort began, his voice cutting through the silence like a knife. His gaze landed on Lucius as he continued, Lucius, tell me what we need to do most urgently. Lucius's body trembled slightly, and he swallowed hard before responding, his voice quivering, Master, we need to infiltrate the Department of Mysteries to retrieve that object. You're mistaken, Lucius, Voldemort interjected sharply, causing Lucius to shudder violently. Before the full extent of his fear could register on his face, Voldemort clarified, Only Harry Potter can secure that object for us. We need Harry Potter. The room fell silent as Voldemort's voice grew irritable. And that Johnny Silver Hand who opposes us, he's like a vermin lurking in the shadows, and I yearn to crush him beneath my heel. 
the hostility emanating from Voldemort was palpable, making it difficult for those closest to him, like Lucius, to breathe. However, Voldemort's tone shifted back to a semblance of normalcy as the hostility vanished abruptly. Once we possess the object, we can easily exterminate that pest. Setting a strategic goal to acquire the mysterious object from the Department of Mysteries was one thing, but devising a plan to lure Potter was another. Voldemort, however, had already formulated a plan. His gaze shifted to the only individual in the room who was not a Death Eater, Narcissa Malfoy. Narcissa, I require your assistance, Voldemort stated, his cold, serpentine eyes locking onto hers. Narcissa felt a chill run down her spine, but unlike Lucius, she maintained her composure and nodded slowly in agreement. As the meeting adjourned, Lucius cast a worried glance at his wife. Narcissa, feeling a surge of warmth from his concern, met his gaze. Be careful, Lucius whispered, gripping her hand tightly. Do not defy the master. Narcissa shot her husband a stern look, her expression hardening. After Lucius hurriedly left the room, his worry evident, Narcissa prepared herself to receive Voldemort's instructions. However, before Voldemort could speak, his expression changed dramatically. For a brief moment, it seemed as though he had lost consciousness. Dark Lord? Narcissa inquired, concern lacing her voice. Voldemort's eyes widened in surprise as he felt something inexplicable occur. This is the second time, he murmured, his expression a mix of confusion and uncertainty. The phenomenon was sudden and unprecedented, leaving him to wonder if it was related to his horcruxes. Yet the sensation was unlike anything he had experienced before. What is happening? Voldemort pondered aloud, his thoughts turning to the golden cup that had gone missing from Gringotts. The realization that he, the Dark Lord, was feel, ing uneasy, was unsettling. Fear was an emotion he was accustomed to instilling in others, not experiencing himself. Regaining his composure, Voldemort's gaze hardened as he looked at Narcissa, a trace of killing intent flickering in his eyes. However, he quickly concealed it, remembering that Narcissa was not only Lucius's wife, but also Bellatrix's sister, and a crucial part of his plan. Suppressing his urge to act on his initial reaction, Voldemort calmly beckoned Narcissa closer and whispered his secret plan into her ear. Narcissa listened intently, her expression betraying nothing of the turmoil that had just unfolded before her. Narcissa's expression remained unchanged throughout the entire conversation, but as she exited the living room, her face twisted into a perplexed frown. What a coincidence, she mused, finding it almost laughable how Johnny Silverhand and Voldemort had devised strikingly similar plans. John awoke gradually, sitting up while rubbing his forehead. Tang Mi was nowhere to be seen, and he had made sure no one could enter his sanctuary. Checking the time on his pocket watch, he wondered, has a whole night passed? His throat felt scratchy, leading to a violent cough that ended with him spitting out a mouthful of black blood. As he stared at the blood, he calculated the time in his mind, realizing one must be exceedingly cautious to delay discovery and miss the chance for rescue. He commented, half in jest, this plan is more ingenious than anything Crab and Goyle could conceive. Voldemort, perhaps due to the fragmentation of his soul, seemed to lack the cunning expected of the Dark Lord. Yet, his ability to embarrass the Ministry of Magic indicated he wasn't entirely devoid of intelligence. On the surface, Crab and Goyle's mission was to poison John as Death Eaters, but the real scheme involved another party. Playing both sides, Tom, you excel in these underhanded tactics, John remarked, wiping the blood from his mouth. Upon picking up a golden cup that had fallen to the ground, the sinister aura it emitted vanished. Hufflepuff's gold cup, he murmured, appreciating its craftsmanship. What Hufflepuff left behind is certainly not mundane. He examined the cup closely, comparing its craftsmanship favorably to Gryffindor's sword and noting its magical essence akin to Ravenclaw's diadem. Securing the gold cup, John now possessed two of the four Founders' relics, with only the Slytherin locket at twelve Grimald Place remaining. A smile crept onto his face as he thought of Voldemort. Tom, our reunion seems imminent. By noon the next day, John emerged from the secret room. His black long-eared owl, Riddle, dozed comfortably in the lavender garden, with Basil, his other owl, beside him. Upon seeing John, Basil flew over, delivering an envelope. After reading the letter with a look of surprise, John burned it. Tang Mi, relieved to see John, 
approached him in the garden. My lord, old Barty has come to visit, he reported respectfully. That's quite the coincidence, John replied, straightening his clothes and donning a silver mask, transforming into Johnny Silverhand. He then asked Tang Mi for some snacks, specifically the ones given to Ozzy Heard previously. Tang Mi, slightly embarrassed, admitted his subordinates had purchased them at a discount. John's comment about the discount made Tang Mi worry about potential repercussions on his salary. In the study, old Barty Crouch sat with his short, meticulously groomed gray hair. John greeted him warmly. Old Barty, congratulations are in order. Minister Crouch has been the most celebrated in the past two decades. Old Barty, clearly pleased, got straight to business, revealing the Ministry of Magic's need for repairs and refurbishments. John, aware of the Ministry's budget constraints, was informed by Barty that savings from equipment maintenance and unpaid taxes had unexpectedly covered the costs. It was clear that those who had forgotten to pay their taxes were more afraid of old Barty's retribution than anything else, highlighting the intricate web of influence and fear that underpinned their interactions. The Ministry of Magic, having recently come into a modest surplus of funds, was finally in a position where Barty Crouch Sr. didn't have to gaze longingly at the statue of the Magical Brethren in the atrium, wondering when it would be dismantled and sold to alleviate financial strain. However, upon learning of Crouch's plans to refurbish the ministry, a peculiar glint appeared in John's eyes. With a sly tone, he remarked, Barty, I have a proposal that could save you a considerable amount of money. At John's words, Crouch's demeanor shifted, his gaze settling on the enigmatic figure of Johnny Silverhand with a mixture of curiosity and caution. 